Good morning, Holy Trinity. We have a great service for you this morning. Pastor Jackson is preaching and he's going to be coming from the last part of chapter one in the book of Acts, which talks about the need for godly leadership and how God provides for that. So looking forward to that. I want to call you to worship this morning. And uh, we serve a holy God. And so as you come into the presence of God, it's actually important to gather your thoughts, to humble yourself, to reverence yourself before him. And so uh, let me read from Psalm 57, something I've been meditating on this week, which David writes, uh, reflecting on the time when he fled from Saul in a cave. And he, he speaks of how God is a hiding place in a moment of danger. So listen, he says, be merciful to me, O God. Don't you need mercy? Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge in the shadow of your wings. I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. In the midst of changing circumstances, chaos, uncertainty, what David is saying is God's a place to hide, a place of protection, of help. But he also says that he is uh, our hope. Listen to what he says. He says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And so part of what I hope for this morning is you can hide in God, but also that you can take your your mind, as David did, off of the circumstances of him being hidden in this cave to God being the God of glory of all things, the God of the universe, and that as you hide in him, he'd also give you hope. So come to worship with me now. Um, I'm going to pray and then we'll sing. Father in heaven, we do come before you and we need your hope. We need your help. We need you to be a place for us in the midst of our chaos and turmoil to hide. So help us to hide in you this morning as we worship you in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing together. Good morning, HTC. I'm Jonathan. As we peer into Acts together, we'll see a small group of people who, despite their circumstances, have taken heart because their Savior Jesus has overcome the world. And we are going to sing about how Jesus is greater, stronger, and higher than our struggles and disappointments. So as you're able, please stand and sing, Our God. Good morning, Holy Trinity. Happy Sunday again. This is Lashira here, um, about to lead you into worship. I hope everyone is staying safe and staying cool. God bless you. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the dark.
Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you that Jesus has ultimately overcome everything in our world that is sad, disappointing, heartbreaking. However, we live in the not yet, and we see you as in a mirror dimly. But when we get to see you face to face, we will fully know all your love has prepared for us. We thank you for this great expectation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. to Holy Trinity Church. I hope this morning has been encouraging for you. Uh, we've come to the portion of our service where we affirm what we believe by reading the Apostles' Creed together. Uh, so I hope you'll take this as an opportunity to be encouraged, knowing that believers have affirmed these words throughout the ages and around the world. So please affirm these words with me. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven 
and is sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, I'm so glad you are here with us today. Let's continue to worship with one another. Salinas here and I have four announcements for you. The first is community groups. So they are launching off and they're meeting virtually based on neighborhoods throughout the city. And so if you're interested and you want to get connected, fill out the form below. Personally, we want to hear about you. We want to pray for you and we want to connect you. And honestly, guys, this is the best way to get involved. Quick plug for me, my community group has only moved me forward. They've become some of my very good friends and they have only impacted me. So fill out the form below. I promise you, I promise you, you won't regret it. Number two, congregational meeting is happening on October 27th, right off the service. So mark your calendar. This is a time where we're gonna vote on new officers for the North Side congregation. And we're going to just share an update on our finances, the vision and direction that Holy Trinity is headed in. So join us October 27th. Mark your calendar right after service. Number three, Campus Outreach is hosting a virtual Bible study called CO312. So tonight, 6 p.m., if you're between the age of 18 and 25, join me um, to connect to worship, to hear from your leaders about issues that directly apply to your life, and honestly, just to have fun. You can also find that link below. Again, virtual Bible study for ages 18 to 25 to connect with others, to grow, and to worship. Lastly, Faith and Work, they're having a series of online conversations that take place throughout the month of October, specifically on Tuesdays at noon. And so the conversations are going to be over the state of reconciliation of America. And so join us as they welcome distinguished guest speakers like the author of Divided by Faith, Michael Emerson. And so each week they're going to candidly examine the case for hope in these troubled times. So the registration link is coming out soon. You don't want to miss out. I got to register for that. Thanks, Heidi. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now and we humble ourselves in your presence. Father, when I think about the greatness and beauty of this earth, and then I think about the heavens and all the galaxies, Lord, we're so, so small and you are so great and yet you still care for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love and your goodness, for your truth. And um, Lord, we are sinners in need of saving. Father, we do not walk in the ways that you command us to. And so we bring before you our sins and we repent and ask for forgiveness. Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the freedom that you provide for us. And thank you for the mediation of Jesus Christ and his atonement. I I pray from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and he gives to all of them their names. Great is our God and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble and he casts the wicked to the ground. 
Lord, I pray like Jerusalem that you would build up this nation. Father, we are in a t- time of turmoil and distress and uncertainty. Lord, I pray that you would just bring bring peace and wisdom and understanding. Lord, that we would be united as brothers and sisters under you as one one race, the human race. Father, I pray that we would celebrate who we are and understand our differences and um, that it would just draw us, draw us closer to you. I pray for our political leaders in leading this nation, um, that you would stir in their hearts a desire to know you and lead a godly nation. Father, I pray for um, Holy Trinity Church Um, Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ, and thank you for the gift of community. We pray for our leaders, that you would be with them, renew their strength, and um, thank you for appointing these leaders to help us in understanding who you are. Um, We pray for all the new babies born. Lord, thank you for the miracle of new life. Um, We pray for new parents and parents growing their families. Um, just be with us during, be with them during this time. And I pray that you would, um, just be with children and as they develop and grow, that they would grow into your likeness. I pray for those in our congregation experiencing a time of loss. Pray for them as they mourn and they grieve, that we would grieve and mourn with them. Fill them with peace and love during during this time. I pray for those going through a season of um, waiting, of uncertainty. I pray that you would um, give them strength and and courage and hope to keep on. I pray for um, resolution and um, a hope for a bright future. Lord, I pray for um, our church partners all across the world and in, in Chicago pray for our missionaries and thank you for the love and courage of those people to go out and spread your word pray for persecuted christians around the world um, where they have to um, fight to know who you are lord renew them give them strength give them power give them certainty even though it can um, feel very hopeless lord thank you for the gift of a new week, of a refreshing, refreshing Sunday and a time of rest and to renew our spirits to um, continue to grow your kingdom wherever we, we work and whoever we're with. And uh, I just pray all these things in your name. Amen. If you are able, would you stand and sing with me? my mind I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree Body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then on the Oh, trample death where we 
reading this morning is Acts 1, 12 through 26. Please turn in your Bibles with me to Acts 1, 12 through 26. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, al Keldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you Lord, who know the hearts of all, 
Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Holy Trinity family, and all who are joining us for this worship service today. Pastor Arthur Jackson with the awesome privilege of being able to proclaim God's word to you today. Let me pray and we will uh, get into God's word. Father, again, we come before you and ask for your help and your wisdom and strength and power to proclaim your truth to your people this day. Blessed be your name. Amen. Acts chapter 1 verses 12 through 26. Already we've heard two messages from Acts chapter 1. And when we get to our text today, we notice that the scene has shifted from what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Physically speaking, Jesus is gone. Huh? He has ascended back to the Father. But before he did that, he had ordered his disciples to not depart from Jerusalem. They were directed to stay there in Jerusalem to wait for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the power that was necessary for their task, and it is necessary and essential for our task today, to make disciples of the nations. As we consider their experience in that day, I've chosen two headers to help us to understand this great passage that is before us and to understand its implications for today. There is number one, a biblical window through which we get to see a beautiful community. And number two, there is an implicit biblical warning that you and I need to heed in our day. A biblical window and a biblical warning. What about the biblical window? In Acts chapter 1 verses 12 through 26, this is the only biblical window that enables us to see what happened between the time that Jesus ascended back to God in glory and the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? Huh? When we look at these, uh, this 15-verse window, if you will, what is it that we really get to see? Based on Jesus' executive order, and we can see that in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, based on that, they were to go to Jerusalem and they were to wait for the power for their assigned mission. Why? Wait, after all, they had been with Jesus for three years and, and had seen the wonderful things that he had done, heard his powerful and awesome words. Oh, but Jesus was gone. And they were powerless within themselves to carry out the mission that Jesus had given them. And guess what, friends? So are we, huh? His disciples obeyed his command and they made this trip of a little over half a mile from Mount Olivet or the Mount of Olives where Jesus had ascended to Jerusalem. And did you notice the first thing that we see in the text? There is a group of 120 people, men and women, who are assembled there together in the upper room. And this group, if you notice there, is not totally anonymous. These were everyday people uh, who had follow Jesus and they're not anonymous because we see their names beginning in verse verse 13 that include the level the 11 remaining apostles Judas gone 
And we also see some additional name, one at least one additional name in verse 14. Huh? They were there. These apostles, and as we look at this particular list, we see Peter, as he is in other lists of apostles, he's first in line there. Huh? We see their names. We've got Peter and John and James and Andrew and the other apostles there. Huh? Their names are there. These are not just anonymous people, but people that have followed Jesus. I mean, this is a historical, actual account that we see here. Huh? They were people like us with hopes and dreams and aspirations and fears and doubts. Huh? Not one among them had not struggled at times with his or her faith or with their desires to even see a fuller realization, a now realization, full-blown uh, uh, realization of God's kingdom. But that was not to come. But they lived and they wrestled with the tension of that while at the same time moving forward, sometimes not without stumbling, but they were moving forward in faith. They were real people, just like you and me. The group included uh, in verse 14, it says, the women. Who were these women? They were likely the women, at least some of them were the women that Luke had mentioned in Luke chapter eight, verse three, that included names like Mary Magdalene, and Susanna and Joanna. These were women who had supported Jesus from their means, Jesus and his, his, his band of apostles who were ministering in that day. I would like also to think that Mary and Martha of Bethany were there. They were women who loved Jesus and followed him. Huh? One woman is named for sure, Mary the mother of Jesus, she was there. And according to what we see in verse 14, so were his earthly brothers, likely the children of Joseph and Mary. They were late adopters, if you will, in believing in Jesus, but eventually they came around. Among Jesus' earthly brothers was James, who eventually became the head uh, apostle there, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And then Jude, who also, with James, wrote one of the letters in the New Testament. Who was it that was in the upper room in that day? People who had been captivated by Jesus. They had been captivated by him to the point that their lives had been disrupted. Huh? They left their businesses. They left their jobs. They left their homes. They abandoned the lifeless, hypocritical religion of their day. They, friends, wanted more. They heard Jesus talk about a different kind of kingdom. They heard him talk about taking up their crosses and laying down their lives. Yet still, they embraced him, huh? Captivated by Jesus. Have you been captivated by our Christ to the point that you are willing to release even worldly kinds of things, really to follow him, to love him, to serve him and obey him. Here in our text, these disciples, they were on the threshold of the next chapter in their lives. Huh? Here was their opportunity to put Jesus teaching, and particularly his teaching about prayer in play. He had told them to wait, but listen to what Jesus had taught them earlier about prayer. It comes from Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, 
listen to this, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? They had heard Jesus teaching and here they were waiting on the coming of the Spirit of God. And so what were they doing? They were praying. Uh, check it out. Take a look at it in verse 14. I love this verse. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Huh? They were unanimous. That is, with one accord. And they were persistent. They were devoting themselves to prayer. The promise had been made and they were praying. It is as, as if they were, had stacked hands together. They were united. They were all pulling in the same direction. They were persevering in their praying and waiting as Jesus had instructed them for the coming of the Spirit of God. Huh? Take a look into this very unique window and you see a beautiful community of the followers of Jesus united in corporate prayer, praying and waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise to send his Spirit William Willimon in his Acts Commentary notes the following. This time between Ascension and Pentecost was once designated by Karl Barth as a significant pause between the mighty acts of God, a pause in which the church's task is to wait and to pray. Huh? Significant pauses, huh? They're not new to the people of faith. It's not new to you and me either, is it? Huh? In fact, such times have characterized the people of faith, the people of God for all ages. Abraham waited 25 years for the fulfillment of a son through Sarah. Huh? The children of Israel waited 400 years for release from the oppression of Egypt, huh? and the list goes on. Uh, the beginning of the New Testament finds the likes of Zechariah and Elizabeth, Simeon and Anna, waiting. Uh -huh. By comparison, the wait between the Ascension and Pentecost is so very small. Yet their posture, what we see through this biblical window, informs us as to how you and I can handle our own significant pauses, whether that is personally or corporately, or as it relates to the church at large who awaits the return of our Lord. Who among us doesn't know something about pauses, be they ever so small. And even we deem them, do we not, significant pauses in our own lives. Huh? We feel as if God has put us on a time out. Huh? Progress is delayed. Dreams and hopes are deferred. How we want to get on with our lives, our business, and sometimes even the business of God, the work of the church, we want to get on with it. But sometimes it seems as if those pause buttons indeed are pushed. Education plans on hold. Marriage plans paused on hold. Childbearing plans and Go with and childbearing pains. Huh? These things, ministry plans on hold. There's a sense even today, friends, 
in which the church and the world find themselves practically in such an hour. On hold. Hmm. On hold with plans. They sometimes some things in the economy on hold. Huh? This COVID moment. Huh, what a season we find ourselves in. Find ourselves restrained from doing what we might want to do. How do we respond? There's no explicit command in our text to wait, but what we see here is very significant for navigating significant pauses, those blessed spaces, let's call them, between promise and fulfillment. And we instruct it, you and I are instructed of what we see here. In the text, our Lord, and even now he's returned to heaven. He has presently sent his Holy Spirit. And the next big event that you and I wait for, the next big event on the divine calendar is our Lord's return in glory, his glorious return. And even now, the church has been waiting for centuries, but it's not an hour for you and me to give up. It's an hour for you and, and me to press on in mission. Praying and waiting. That's what believers in Jesus do. And what we see here is absolutely beautiful. This, this picture, this snapshot. As we look at this window, we can peer. Think about the, the praying and, and if you could just get an earful. Huh? No doubt it would draw us in with them and compel us to join them by what they're doing. It's beautiful. This is a Psalm 133 in one moment. What, what does that say? Oh, how good and how pleasant or how beautiful it is when brothers dwell in unity. That's what we see in this text. This beautiful community of Christ's followers uh, today has grown beyond this Jewish nucleus that we see in this first believing band, huh? God's beautiful community today, friends, includes Jews and Gentiles, huh? People from every nation, kindred, and tongue are part of God's beautiful community, huh? It includes the likes of all who hear these words today. I don't know exactly where you come from, don't know your background, but if you are a believer in Jesus, it matters not uh, the place where you come from. It matters not the color of your skin. It matters not what's in your bank account. If you believe in Jesus, we share a common communion. We share a common identification in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And even we are seated with him even now in the heavenlies in Christ. What a beautiful community. Those who have seen and are being captured and captivated by Jesus are amongst our family. Praying and waiting is our posture as believers. Hmm? I've had the privilege over the years of being in prayer meetings and sometimes all night prayer meetings. Huh? And sometimes in expressing prayers to God, simply chanting or singing to God, I've heard the saints say, waiting, huh? waiting, huh? talking to God, waiting. Hmm. And then they would add to it. They would say, we wait on you. We wait on you. We wait on you. Huh? We wait on you. 
We wait on you. We wait on you. Waiting. <laughs> and just on. In the presence of God. Waiting. Praying and waiting is what the people of God do. Huh? But that's not all that we do. And that's not all that they did. <laughs> they waited but they also took care of business. You see that in verses 15 and following. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was uh, all about 120 and said, and it goes on down, he takes care of business. The waiting time, and this is what I want to say in this. Waiting time need not be wasted time for the church. Hmm? Waiting time need not be wasted time for the church. The main agenda and item that came into view in the text was the replacement of a leader. A vacancy in the apostolic ranks was created because G uh, Judas had defected. He had betrayed Jesus and he went on to his fate. He was not there. There was an empty chair around the table, if you will. The 12 had become 11. Don Carson notes this. The number of 120 here is, is more than just a round number. This is the smallest number in Jewish tradition for a population that can have its own council. There was a tradition that each judge should rule or represent at least 10 members. And maybe therefore that Luke is suggesting that the young church was already a community in its own right and that a 12th leader was required. Huh? They were taking care of business. The community needed the 12th leader. How then did they go about the business at hand? As we already have seen in verse 14, corporately and prayerfully and carefully. And here the business is filling a vacancy in order to get the right person on the team. Hmm? Well, they saw, I mean, if you see here, we don't have time to go into it all. But as we look here, they saw portions both of Psalms 69 and 109 as applying to Judas, who had fallen from his sacred office and who needed to be replaced. That was the work at hand. Huh? They did what they could in narrowing down. They had some, some objective criteria. That is here, it had to be one who had accompanied them from the beginning of Judas Jesus's ministry. And in their own way, they narrowed it down to two, but then they appealed to God. They did the things objectively what they could. They measured by certain standards that were there. But then they appealed to God. And we notice how they appealed to him in verse 24. And they prayed and say, said, Lord, you, Lord, who know the heart of all, show which one of these you have chosen. Huh? They did what they could do. They took care of business, but then appealed to God to do what he alone could do. Huh? And Matthias ended up getting the call. Huh? Through this biblical window, we see the disciples of Jesus they're united and devoted to prayer as they waited on the promise of God, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And they were diligent to take care of the business at hand. 
a biblical window that you and I get to see what's going on during this very significant pause between the ascension of Jesus and the descent of the Holy Spirit. But we also have in this text a biblical warning that we need to heed. And it's not direct, it's indirect, and it's implicit. But there here is a warning in these passages that relate to Judas and his betrayal and his fate and all of that. There is a warning for us here against defection from the grace and the kindness of God. It's a warning for us not to be casual in our calling as followers of Jesus. There's an indirect call here, friends, for us to be watchful and to be careful. Judas was privileged in his calling, but he was casual about his calling. And friends, that should never be. All the things that can attract us and divert us, huh? We are warned, are we not, through the life of Judas, who, verse 17, was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry? Huh? We are warned to be on guard against hypocrisy and greed and ambition and anything that puts us at odds with kingdom values and kingdom principles as they are defined by God himself. Huh? This thought that Judas may have had political aspirations and that seeing Jesus uh, uh, creating a, an earthly kingdom and some feel that he could have been disenchanted with that and that was uh, uh, underneath his betrayal. Huh? But we are here warned, friends, are we not, not to detour, to take a detour from God's grace. Why not? Detours from grace can quickly end up in disgrace. Huh? Taking a detour from God's love and his favor and his mercy from grace can end up in disgrace, can end up in shame. Huh? How quickly one can go from grace to disgrace. We are warned when we look at this account historically, and we are warned by this example and from the lives of people in our own day who have chosen detours. We can detour morally. We can detour doctrinally. And you and I know such people, do we not? Through the life of Judas and the lives of others, and even perhaps from personal experience, we are warned and forewarned that detours from grace can end up in disgrace. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for that courts above daily we can be tempted to detour from God's grace and none of us escapes temptations and distractions huh? detours from grace can put us in a fog of despair and sometimes it's difficult for us to find our way back home oh God have mercy as you think. Think of those who may have walked with you for a stretch of the road. And as you look at their lives today, where are they? Some trying to find their way back, but seemingly can't do it, huh? Oh, on the one hand, it's sort of a dark, scene or a dark thing to think about Judas, but there is a bright spot here, is it not? Because we see Peter. Huh? Peter embraced grace. Peter knew something about detours. But guess what, friends? 
he found his way back. And we see him in this text restored not only to a place of grace, but to a place of leadership. This is the same Peter who three times denied that he knew the Lord Jesus. But he had been restored. How had he been restored? He had been restored through repentance and God's grace. And oh, that's the same path of, to restoration today. You may be listening to me and you're taking a bad turn or two. Huh? Repentance is turning around. And can I encourage you to turn around before you go too, go too far? Before you reach that perhaps point of no return, turn back even now. Huh? The restored Peter, friends, was a part of the beautiful community that we see here. And Luke will go on to show, particularly in Acts chapters 1 through 12, that the very prominent role that a restored Peter filled and fulfilled in the infant church. Huh? Such, friends, is the nature of God's grace. I close on today with Peter's words found in 1 Peter 3, verses 11 through 13. And there he's speaking about the end of the age that, and the Lord's return. Listen, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, the elements in, in and of the world, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? And here's our word, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But, According to his promise, there it is, isn't it? We are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, huh? Oh, beautiful community today. May the Lord be with us and strengthen us as we assume our posture as our believing forebearers did in their day. Our mixed up world needs the kind of people that we see in our text, the kind of people that we aspire to be and have become and are becoming. People who navigate the space between promise in fulfillment. So beautiful community today. May we be prayerful and careful. May we be faithful and fruitful. Watchful and hopeful. Our world needs that kind of people. And may the Lord strengthen us to be nothing less. Shall we pray, Father in heaven, Thank you for this text in which we have a biblical window. We get to see your people praying and waiting, but a biblical warning, an implicit warning is that we would not defect or depart from grace. Be with us is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen and amen.
you, Holy Trinity family, and all who were a part of today's service. Uh, may we depart with a benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.